Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Welcome to the South Burlington Public Library. Uh, my name is Mira. I'm a librarian here. Uh, so for those of you joining us in person, um, important details, restrooms and water fountains are immediately behind the back of the auditorium. Uh, just go straight out the auditorium doors, uh, down the hallway a couple paces and you'll be there. Uh, for the emergency exit, the nearest one is straight out the back of the auditorium and to your left. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, food and drink are not permitted in the auditorium, and now is a fabulous time to silence your cell phones or any other devices that might make noise during this special event. For those who are joining us in Zoom, please note that live transcripts have been enabled. If you do not see these, you may need to turn the captions on in the options at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The chat has also been enabled in Zoom. Uh, please feel free to put your questions in the chat and they will be collected uh, to be asked at the end of the presentation. This event is being recorded. And I'm going to step aside in a moment so that the Executive Director of Vermont Humanities Christopher Kaufman Ilstrup can introduce the rest of our speakers tonight. Thank you. I have a, a stack of young adult novels. It's my security blanket. <laughs> uh, my name is Christopher, and thank you, Mira, for hosting us. Uh, I have a few uh, notes just to make sure that I do all the appropriate uh, thank yous for the evening. Uh, so really excited to have uh, Melinda with us, author of Last Night at the Telegraph Club, of course, and many other novels. Um, but Last Night is our Vermont Reads 2023 pick. And throughout Vermont all year from July 1st to, uh, to June 30th of this coming year, nearly 60 communities across the state have been doing community projects, uh, gathering in classrooms and libraries, at work, in community centers, state employees um, have been reading this work uh, and discussing the work. Uh, they've held pride celebrations, hosted cooking classes, organized field trips, and hosted talks which have furthered community conversations about the many ideas explored in this important work. Um, I do wanna say that if you haven't come to this work through Vermont Reads, there is still time to sign up and do a project um, this year. We'll be doing Vermont Reads all the way through June 30th with, uh, with Last Night at the Telegraph Club. So just visit the website, vermonthumanities.org, um, or speak to any of the Vermont Humanities staff members tonight, and they can get you set up um, with what you need to do a community project in your own community, get free copies of the book, and engage with these themes. Um, before we begin tonight's program, I, need, I do need to acknowledge many supporters uh, for both tonight's event and for Vermont Reads this year. Um, thank you, as always, to our long-term Vermont Reads underwriters, in some cases going back to the very beginning of the program, uh, 22 years ago, uh, the Trout Lily Foundation and the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation. I'd also like to acknowledge the Vermont Department of Libraries, who supports our Young Adult Author Residency Program, which includes um, tonight's program um, and tomorrow's work at Teen Lit Mob. Um, new this year, um, we want to thank the Jay Warren and Lois McClure Foundation, who are going to be partnering with us to support Vermont Reads 2024, the upcoming book that will start on July 1st. Um, and part of the reason why I have this stack of books is because for the very first time um, in front of a public audience, we're gonna say that Vermont Reads 2024 is Gather by Ken Ketta. There'll be more information on our website about Gather and Vermont Reads 2024 in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Gather is a homegrown book. Um, Ken Caddo is the co-principal of Oxbow High School um, in Vermont. And uh, like Melinda and Tobin, is also a member of the National Book Award family. Um, he was nominated for the National Book Award for Young People's Literature this past year. Um, for tonight, I also want to say special thanks to Outright Vermont, our statewide queer youth organization who partnered with Vermont Humanities on this year's project. 
Uh, they offered facilitator training, assisted schools and libraries who were organizing youth and multi-generational events. And we also want to thank the Museum of Chinese in America, based out of New York City, who provided their traveling exhibit to us, Responses, Asian American Voices Resisting the Tides of Racism, um, and the Manchester Community Library in Southern Vermont, who are hosting the exhibit through April 19th. If you get a chance to drive down Route 7 um, to Manchester to see the exhibit, it's quite powerful. Um, we're grateful to the many community partners across the state who host Vermont Reads partner projects, including those who are with us tonight, like the Brownell Library of Essex Junction, a longtime partner in our Snapshot program, um, formerly First Wednesdays, and they partnered with the Dorothy Ailing Library on Vermont Reads projects this year. Thank you for being here. Um, and of course, thank you to National Book Award winner Melinda Lowe for not only writing a fantastic book and many other fantastic books, including A Scatter of Light here, also in the stack, which you can buy uh, from Phoenix Books out front. Uh, Melinda and Tobin uh, will both be signing books um, after the event this evening. Um, so tomorrow, uh, Teen Lip Mob is happening at U32 High School, and there will be hundreds of young people um, meeting uh, Melinda, who have been reading her work um, at that event. So we're very excited that you're here and you're doing that event as well. Thank you. Um, finally, of course, thanks to our partners at the South Burlington Public Library, particularly Mira Geffner and Amanda Brown, who helped this make, make this event happen, as well as the National Book Foundation, who partnered with us for tonight's program. Um, Vermont Humanities connected with National Book Foundation just about a year ago. They've been amazing partners and collaborators, uh, both on this project and on future schemes that we're already cooking up together. Uh, it was a personal honor for me to represent Vermont um, at the National Book Awards um, this past year, where uh, we had not just one, but two Vermont authors represented as finalists in the category of young people's literature, both Ken Caddo's Gather and Dan Knott's Hidden Systems. With that, uh, I would like to welcome the Deputy Director of the National Book Foundation, Jordan Smith, joining us from New York City uh, to give a few remarks and introduce our conversationalists. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Jordan Smith, Deputy Director at National Book Foundation. Thrilled to join Mira and Christopher in welcoming you to this evening's event. Many thanks to the wonderful teams at Vermont Humanities, South Burlington Public Library, and Brownell Library for making our first ever in-person event collaboration in the state of Vermont possible. Um, on behalf of National Book Foundation, we're so happy to be here. And on a personal note, I actually began my time at National Book Foundation uh, working on our education program. So personally, I'm extra excited to be here um, to celebrate excellent literature written for young people. Um, every fall, the National Book Foundation presents the National Book Awards, uh, which have been honoring the best literature published in the United States since 1950. The awards fuel our year-round work, reaching readers in 49 states and counting almost there to 50, uh, giving out free books and partnering on events like this one. We're always thinking about how we can be more supportive to the greater ecosystem of book lovers, um, and which is why this past year we launched a new program, a teacher fellowship, that supports sixth through 12th grade teachers in inspiring their students to fall in love with reading. Um, we're in the process of selecting our next cohort of fellows and applications will open again in February. So if you have teachers in your lives, I hope you spread the word uh, about that opportunity to them. So this year is a big one for us. It's the 75th National Book Awards ceremony on November 20th. We hope you'll visit our website at nationalbook.org and sign up for our newsletter so we can keep in touch on all the exciting news ahead. There's also a sign up sheet um, out on the Vermont Humanities table. Um, lots of exciting things happening around our 75th anniversary, including a prize filled summer reading adventure for adults. So if you remember the Book It Pizza Hut challenge of your youth and you loved that, this is gonna be a program for you. Lots of prizes, lots of some fu fun summer reading this year. So I'm honored to introduce our two very special guests this evening, Melinda Lowe and M.T. Anderson. Melinda will read from her National Book Award winning Vermont Read Selection last night at the Telegraph Club and join fellow National Book Award honored author M.T. in conversation. 
We'll save some time at the end for a few audience questions. And at the conclusion of the event, we'll have a book signing with many thanks to tonight's bookseller, Phoenix Books. Now I'll get to read their bios without further ado. Melinda Lowe is the New York Times bestselling author of seven novels, including A Scatter of Light. Her novel, Last Night at the Telegraph Club, won the National Book Award for Young People's Literature, the Stonewall Book Award, the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature, a Michael L. Prince honor, and was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist. She has been honored by the Carnegie Corporation as a great immigrant. M.T. Anderson is the author of the National Book Award finalist, Creed, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. The National Book Award winning The Astonishing Life of Octavia Nothing, Traitor to the Nation, Volume 1, The Pox Party, and its sequel, The Kingdom on the Waves, both New York Times bestsellers and Michael L. Prince honor books. The National Book Award long-listed Symphony for the City of the Dead, Dmitry Shoshkatovich, and The Siege of Leningrad, Landscape with Invisible Hand, and many other books for children and young adults. And now I'm pleased to welcome Melinda. everyone i'm i'm kind of short how's that um thank you all so much for coming out to see me tonight um the day after the eclipse i can't believe you're able to leave your house and are not just flat on your back in awe still i i thought it was amazing um but i'm here to talk about this book not the eclipse so um last night at the telegraph club is set in 1954 san francisco the main character lily is a 17 year old Chinese American girl. She lives in Chinatown with her family. And I'm gonna read a couple of short scenes from the book for you tonight. In this first scene, um, Lily has brought her friend and classmate, Kath, to a drugstore, Thrifty Drugs, because Lily wants to show Kath a pulp novel that she has found there. Lily spun the rack of tawdry paperbacks again, then began to flip through novel after novel, hunting for the provocative cover of Strange Season. The blonde that had to be Patrice in her negligee on the floor, the brunette Maxine with dark eyes above in her sultry black gown. Lily was aware of Kath beside her, watching, and she said, it's been here for weeks. I thought it would still be here. What was it about? Kath asked. When she decided to show the book to Kath, Lily hadn't considered the possibility that it would be gone. She had hoped the book would do the work of voicing the questions she wanted to ask, but without it, she was back where she had started. She was faced with a choice now. She could explain what the book had been about, or she could lie. Lily backed away into the corner between the science fiction rack and the rear wall of the store, and Kath followed her. They were quite alone now, and above them the fluorescent light buzzed as if a mosquito were trapped inside the bulb. It was about two women. Lily's mouth felt so dry she might choke on the words. That book, Strange Season, it was about two women and they fell in love with each other and then she asked the question that had taken root in her that was even now unfurling its leaves and demanding to be shown the sun have you ever heard of such a thing cat's eyes widened briefly and then she looked down at the floor and over at the science fiction rack and back at lily who felt her heart thudding like a drum her blood rushing through her veins and turning her skin pink as she waited for Kath's response. An eternity seemed to pass. The heat of the fluorescent light on her head was like an artificial sun. The cash register at the front of the store rang like an alarm bell. Finally, Kath said one soft word, yes. So I'm going to read another very brief scene. This is just an excerpt from the chapter when Lily and Kath visit the Telegraph Club for the very first time. The rear of the stage was covered by a black curtain, 
and Lily wondered if someone was going to step out from behind it. She had been waiting for this for so long that these last few moments seemed interminable. She quivered in her shoes as she gazed at the stage, at the people seated near the edge. She was jealous of their proximity to that microphone. And at Kath, who was watching the stage just as she was, then there was a murmur behind them and all the people packed into their section turned toward the archway. Someone was making their way through the crowd. Lily couldn't see the person clearly, only the motion of others making way like a wave, but she followed the ripple and turned along with her neighbors as that person strolled through the audience and finally stepped onto the low stage and into the spotlight. Lily knew that this was Tommy Andrews' male impersonator. She knew that the entire point of the show was the fact that the performer was not a man. Someone nearby whispered, is that really a woman? And Lily squirmed with embarrassment because that question led her to imagine what Tommy's body looked like under her suit. And that seemed so disrespectful, like those men who had leered at them at the bowling alley. Lily felt a queasy, self-conscious confusion. It was wrong to stare, and yet Tommy was on stage, and they were supposed to look. They would be rude not to watch, so she did. All right. Thank you so much. Now, M.T. Anderson, I invite you to join me, and we will have a little conversation. Are you sure? All right. We're so excited to have you here. Thanks for coming on up. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. And I'm glad you got to see the uh, the eclipse. We don't do that for every National Book Award winner who visits us. They didn't do that for you? No, no, no. We just threw that on for you. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so we are very excited to talk about the book. Um, Vermont has been thinking about it now for almost a year. And uh, I think that first, the question which I'm sure everyone wants to know the answer to, which really, what was the sort of original inspiration for this book? Like, what was the what was the germ of the story? Where did that come from? Well, this novel actually emerged from, oops, sorry, we're a little spinny around here. Um, <laughs> this novel actually emerged from a short story that I wrote called New Year, and it was published in an anthology called All Out, the no longer secret stories of queer teens throughout the ages. So it was a collection of historical fiction about queer teens. So the idea for the story came from a couple of nonfiction books that I had been reading at the time. I, I was reading a book called Rise of the Rocket Girls by Natalia Holt. That was about the women computers who worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab in the 1940s and 50s. And I was also reading a book called Wide Open Town, a History of Queer San Francisco by Nan Ella Milla Boyd. So that was an academic history of queer San Francisco. And in that book, I learned that in the 1950s, there was a huge number of gay and lesbian bars in the city, like way more than there are now. It was, it was quite lively. And uh, so these Wide Up in Town and Rise of the Rocket Girls have nothing to do with each other at all. Mm -hmm. I was just reading them kind of around the same time and they, the ideas kind of mixed in my head. And I got the idea for this character of Lily, this girl who is really into rocket science um, and also thinks she might be a lesbian. Clearly they go together in my head. So um, that was where the story began. But maybe it's actually the fact that they're not, uh, like that, that they don't follow necessarily from one uh, right. another that makes them into a textured character like Lily. I hope so, yeah, definitely. So then, okay, so you have this, you, you have this idea, there's this character bopping around in your head mm -hmm. um, from this sort of confluence of two things. Um, what research did you then do to, mm. I mean, cause you, I mean, it seems to me there are two milieus you had to do research into, one of which is Chinatown in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and the other of which is the, you know, the queer world of, of San Francisco in that period. Yeah, yeah, there were there was a lot of research because I um I had never really been that interested in mid-century San Francisco. Like it wasn't like a 
I wasn't like a buff about, around this. I, I wasn't into it, right? So I knew nothing about the 1950s. I literally started with a book called The 1950s. <laughs> um, so I had to do a lot of research and there's a ton of stuff out there about the 1950s. There's a lot of stuff about Asian American history um, and there is queer history available, um, but there was nothing about queer Asian American history in the 1950s in San Francisco. So I had to do all this research into different fields and kind of imagine how they would intersect. Um, very few historians had done that kind of work uh, when I was researching this book. Um, since then, you know, someone like Hugh Ryan, I think, is that his name? He did a book about the Women's House of Correction in New York in the 1950s. And um, there's been more work since then, but I was doing this research like in 2016, 2017, which isn't actually that long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, most of history is divided into these little areas. So a lot of my research was like um, reading footnotes. And because if there was a queer Asian person in history that was referenced in a book about San Francisco history, I would have to go to the footnotes and because that's the only place they would be mentioned. And, and in that book, Wide Open Town, there was one footnote about um, these this place called the Forbidden City, which was a nightclub in San Francisco. And it appears in this book. Um, it was a nightclub in Chinatown. And in the book, Wide Open Town, the history, it was mentioned that lesbians of color would go to the Forbidden City. And that was the only mention I found of that anywhere. So I looked at the footnotes and the historian had interviewed one person about this. And her interview was archived at the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco. So I went there and I listened to the interview. It had not been transcribed. Um, it was just, it was on a cassette tape. So I went and listened to it and that was fascinating. So a lot of my research was like this, digging through footnotes, trying to track down sources and also talking to people. You know, I talked to two um, Chinese American queer women who lived in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. I interviewed them about their lives. And that was that was really wonderful. And they were very generous uh, with their time with me, too. So that's incredible. Now, um, I mean, you evoke the city so beautifully. Um, but I happen to know, because I did creepy research, that you're from Colorado. I mean, you lived yeah. in Colorado in your childhood. How, was there a period when you were living in San Francisco? How did you know the city so well and convey it to those of us who live on dirt roads? Uh, yeah, no, I, live in, I lived in San Francisco for 15 years. Okay, I did um, as much creepy research as I should. Yeah, from like 2000 to 2015, I was there. So, um, but I actually wrote this book after I left San Francisco. So I still had to go back to San Francisco. And I literally walked through the city going everywhere that Lily would go to look at the city because San Francisco still kind of looks like the 19th it looks the way it did. I mean, there's like, new, just erase the skyscrapers. But a lot of the city is still the same look that it had in the 1950s. And I know this because I also watched a lot of movies um, filmed in San Francisco in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, like if you watch Vertigo, which was filmed in San Francisco in the 1950s, it looks very similar to today. You just have to change the cars. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I went back to San Francisco to do more location research. That's very, well, I mean, I feel like it comes out like in the book, like we can get a sense of the city as a kind of a pulsing mm -hmm. organism with all these communities that are interacting. Yeah, so as you. you did this, this um, research, were there, what were some of the facts that like surprised you? We went, whoa, that's, uh, that's really wild that that's true. You know, what's interesting is reading in reading Wide Open Town, um, the historian wrote a lot about the gay bars of the 1940s and 50s. And she described their layouts, like the architectural layout of these bars and how you would go in and it would be a long, narrow room and there would be a long bar um, when you first go in. So the bartender can keep their eye on the door. And um, you would go through the long bar room and in the back, there'd be like a little performance area because a lot of these bars at the time had nightclub acts and there would always be a back door because in case there was a police raid you would have to flee out the back 
And what was fascinating to me was I've gone to a lot of lesbian bars in San Francisco in the time that I lived there, and they're still in the same buildings, and they still have the same layouts. So in a way, it was really amazing to think my queer community was just was inheriting the queer community that was that Nan Boyd researched for her book. And the, my queer community is a direct descendant of that community of the 1950s. So I have I was not alive in the 50s, but I still inhabited some of those same queer spaces. And I felt very physically connected to that time because of my own experiences in the city. So I think um, I used a lot of that in the book. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and were there particular figures from either your research into sort of like Chinatown of the period or or in fact into rocketry of the period or into the um, into the uh, the gay history of the city in, in that period? Were there particular figures who you came across you kind of like transferred in your book, either under their name or, you know, under a name you created? Yeah, you know, Lily's Lily's Aunt Judy. Uh, who works at JPL was very much inspired by a woman in Rise of the Rocket Girls, Helen, I can't remember her last name, Lee or Lynn. She was one of the very first um, Asian American women who worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab. She ended up becoming a supervisor there and hired many more Asian women to work there. And so I really based Judy kind of on her. I mean, they're very different people. They're, I mean, I know very little about Helen. <laughs> <laughs> but it really inspired me to know that there were Asian American women working there from the very beginning when they first started hiring women at all. And she um, she was very inspiring to that character. Um, one really kind of funny thing is that the character of Tommy, who is the performer in, in this book, um, I named her Tommy because in my research into lesbian history in San Francisco, I kept running into lesbians named Tommy. Like this was like this, there were at least two well-known Tommy Tommies who were lesbians. So I was like, oh, I'll, I'll name her Tommy. So um, that's where Tommy came from. <laughs> but also, it's funny because for me, at least reading it, I was very then shocked and kind of horrified late in the book where she's referred to, I think, as Teresa or something. Is that, yeah. right? Is that the name? Yeah. I mean, it feels very like wrong suddenly to have that, which I thought was a really nice kind of like the, you know, uh, outside that that space where she is known, where she's a celebrity, mm -hmm. to have her kind of like denuded in that way seems really uh, kind of oh. brutal. Oh, yeah. Well, her parents would not have named her Tommy. <laughs> no, no, I figured. <laughs> I figured. Yeah. Now, it's interesting you bring up Judy, because I, I was actually going to ask you, like, she has a really, really, like, moving to the characters, she has such an interesting, uh, complicated relationship with Lily as the book goes on. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, so how do you see her uh, playing the role she does in Lily's life? Uh, well, I think that Judy is really a hero for Lily. I mean, Lily sees that Judy is doing what she wants to do. She's a, She studied math and now she's doing math professionally and she's building rockets, you know? That's amazing to, to Lily. So I think she really looks up to her Aunt Judy. And I really wanted Lily to have an adult figure in her family who, if not, who maybe doesn't fully understand Lily at this time, but is far enough outside the normal expectations of what a good Chinese wife does that she can see that Lily is serious, you know, and the, it, and she can support her in pursuing something that is not the norm. So I really, I really wanted um, Lily to have a figure in her family who was like that. I just think it's very important. And it's also important to me because, you know, families, they're not, everyone in the family is not the same. You know, if you're a queer kid, maybe your parents don't fully understand or accept your identity at first, but you might have a grandparent who does, you know, and it, or, or an aunt or an uncle or a cousin, you know, and I think that I, it was very important for me to, for Lily's family to be like that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's such a great figure for that reason and provides a, um, an important element there for late in the book. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, now, and also we get to know her and other members of the family through these flashbacks. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, from the point of view of pure plot, mm -hmm. the flashbacks are, uh, you know, I mean, you could call them in, in one way, like 
plot extraneous. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if it's a rom-com, you don't need to know what happened 15 years. But so like, what was the idea in, in having the, 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 that extra perspective that you added with those? Well, those were my editors. I, that was my editor's idea. Wait, so are you telling us you're still pissed? Are you going to go like, Huh? <laughs> no, you're like, yeah, she made me add those. No, no, my my editor, um, uh, Andrew Carr, whom you I understand will be working with, he suggested that I write some scenes from the perspectives of Lily's parents. And I was like, really? I thought that YA could only have teenage characters in them. And he was like, no. <laughs> so I uh, I did. I wrote a bunch of scenes uh, from Lily's parents' perspectives, and he um, I wrote them, and I showed them to Andrew. And we I didn't use them all. There are some scenes that will never see the light of day, um, but the ones that we cho we chose, um, I feel like they were important to the book because they illuminated the pressures that her parents were feeling, you know, like if you didn't have the scenes from her parents' point of view, I think that today's readers might not understand what, why they do what they do at the end of the book. But for a family in the 1950s, a Chinese American family at that point, that's the thing they're going to do. And I, I really wanted readers to understand that broader context, that Lily comes from a family that has a history. There are reasons they do things. And um, so that's that's why they're in there. And it was also really fun to write them. So that was <laughs> but cool. he, I would say even earlier in the book, um, the family's reaction to the accusations of communism. Mm -hmm. um, like it's it's really for an American reader, especially, it's important to understand why there's that dimension of like, wait, we have to cleanse ourselves of this accusation. Mm -hmm. You know, the, and I think that those uh, flashbacks really help to situate us, um, especially younger readers who might not know exactly the history. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought that they did a beautiful job of that. And then, so somewhat similarly, the timelines are a really interesting feature of the book. I mean, like, because the timelines, for example, they overlapped to mm -hmm. some extent, and but some of the events we hear about, some of them we don't. So it's a really interesting way of uh, contextualizing things. T talk about the timelines. The timelines came from uh, uh, a person, a, a writer friend of mine who read a draft of this, and she was like, when is this happening? I don't understand when this chapter is happening. I was like, okay, I'm going to have to explain something, because I, 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 it does switch, jump in time, and I couldn't figure out how to how to explain it. Like, I didn't want to insert it in the dialogue, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, is it already 1953? That's right. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, so I came up with the idea of the timelines really late in the process. It was after I had written those scenes with the with the parents and after we'd moved them around in the book. And um, I realized I could use the timelines to also indicate other historical events, mm -hmm. you know, like World War II happens. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not writing World War II in this book, <laughs> but I can indicate that it happened. And I can, I could also indicate other things that like the law that was passed in San Francisco that, I, that allowed gay people to meet in public. That's in there. If you want to dig into it, you can look it up. Um, but then I, I didn't have to explain it. So um, the timelines were really, I really liked them. And I, I came up with them as this like, when I sent them to the, my my editor and the manuscript, I I designed them to look like, you know, on your phone when you're like scroll when you like enter like a, the timer on your iPhone and you like scroll it up and down to select the number of minutes. And I designed it to look like that. And I was I was surprised the designer kept it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was it was fun. I really enjoyed it. But I like the way, like, for example, for readers who know who McCarthy is, yeah. like to kind of see him drift into view. And there's just there's a really kind of sinister sense of, oh, stuff is going to start happening, you know, like, yeah. Like, yeah. If you know who he is. Yeah. 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 But I mean, you actually then refer to him. Right. Right. Thing. And so like yeah. it's a beautiful contextualizing tool that's very gentle at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so, I mean, this uh, raises a question. Did you plan out the whole of this book before you wrote it? Or did you like just launch into the material and see where it took you? This one, um, because it's not like a really plot heavy book, I just, I just, I didn't have, I don't think I had too much of an outline. I think I knew what I was doing, 
or I thought I, I mean, I didn't really, but I thought I knew what I was doing. And I was like, there's not really that much plot. So I'll just, keep, I'll just go. And so I wrote the Lily storyline straight through. I wrote the adult chapters after that, probably in the second or third draft, I wrote them. And then, um, yeah, so mm -hmm. it wasn't a ton of plot. Like I'd done it pre before this book, I had written a psychological thriller that was very plot driven. And I had outlined that book to within an inch of its life. And I got the ending wrong three times. <laughs> so I do outline, but that doesn't mean that I actually know what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I sometimes I have to write it and then see yeah. if it works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when speaking of books um, that uh, connect with this or are adjacent to it, Mm -hmm. A Scatter of Light. Talk about its connection to this book. Yeah, so A Scatter of Light um, is set about 60 years after this book. So there are no crossover characters. Um, but there is a mention of Lily and Kath in it. So if you haven't read A Scatter of Light and you want to find out more about them, you can read A Scatter of Light. However, it is very, very different. It is a, I mean... It's not a. It's set in 2013, so it's not exactly a contemporary novel, but it's it's in modern day, and it's about a girl named Arya Tong West and her summer between high school and college. It is um, about a very messy first relationship, first queer relationship. It's about art and science, so there's some science connections. And um, you you can read it and find out how it is related to Telegraph Club. It's, and it's available in the lobby for seventeen ninety nine. That too, yes. <laughs> um, so okay, you began your career writing fantasy books, yeah, yeah, like Ash, which is part of it's a sort of a darkly passionate retelling of the Cinderella story. With and it, so there's it's a, a lesbian Cinderella. Yeah. And there's a there's a, a kind of a, a created world with sort of with fairies, like fairy lords, that kind of thing. Um, so which is easier, creating your own world entirely or um, trying to painstakingly reconstruct the real world as it existed uh, 70 years ago? Oh, historical fiction is much easier. Really? OK, go. Yeah. It's why? much easier. I don't have to make anything up. But wait, I would think that you know you can make stuff up. That's why it makes it easier to do the fantasy. No, novel. because in a fantasy, I am very exacting. Okay, <laughs> so in a fantasy novel that I write, it has to make sense to me, and okay. so I have to come up with reasons for things. Mm. Whereas in a historical novel, you don't need to come up with reasons. You just research it, <laughs> and then you know the world is senseless. <laughs> I I love doing research though. So if you don't like doing research probably fantasy is more your jam. Mm -hmm. I, I love doing research. Like I, I dropped out of graduate school. I was going to get a PhD. I love research. Wait, so what was the PhD going to be in? Cultural anthropology. Okay. So yeah, yeah, not history, but I mean, I'm very, all my books are very anthropological. That sounds weird, but they're, I'm very interested in culture and uh, how it is created. So you can see that in the, her going to these bars. That's, that's, that's anthropology. What? I mean, so I love doing historical research. So that is why I think that historical fiction is easier because you can just look it up. <laughs> right. But so, okay. But how are these two processes, creating a fantasy world and creating a historical world, how are, how are they similar as, as a writer, like entering into it? I mean, you still have to broadcast that world to the reader. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely a lot of world building in both historical fiction and in fantasy and science fiction because you are building a world that the reader does not live in. You know, so that you still have to do that kind of setting the scene, explaining the rules of the world, because a, a reader of a, like a 15 year old reader today does not know what 1954 San Francisco is like necessarily. So you do have to explain how it works. And um, that's I think that's a challenge of all kinds of writing, though. Like, how do you set a world without being um, how do you set it subtly and deeply mm -hmm. without losing the reader? and not doing all the, as you know, Bob, discussions, <laughs> right? Right. So, right. Yeah. so for in this book, for me, I invented the timeline to avoid, as you know, Bob. Right, right, right. Yeah, were there other uh, devices you used to kind of like slip in info for us? Um, 
what else did I do? Well, my I did write a very long office note at the end. That's, that wasn't that. Just, yeah. That's not that. Yeah. Um, no, I think that I just tried to. I, I tried to be true to the time period. I used the language of the time period. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried to use everything that was in the 50s. Like she listens to music from that time. She eats the food of the time. She, you know, wears the clothes of the time. She does the extracurricular curricular activities of the time. Like who does bowling now? That's a bowling is a 50s thing. Mm -hmm. You're in Vermont. There are people. A lot of people do bowling here. Okay. <laughs> a lot of bowling here. You really need to. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Just cast sorry. your mind back <laughs> to last week. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the scenes of Lily worried, and this is related, in fact, to understanding a different period. The scenes of Lily worried about how the revelation of her sexual desires will change things at school was very, very powerful to me. The anxiety was really palpable. Mm -hmm. You really caught that fear of being outed. Um, now, how do you see the attitude toward, toward alternative sexualities and towards LGBT plus students being different now? And how is it the same? Um, I think it's, it's one major difference is that there is uh, much more popular culture about LGBTQ lives and people. There are famous queer people now. And in the 1950s, there weren't really. And also there was no internet. So this is a really big problem because Lily had to discover her sexual identity without being able to point to any gay people. Like she doesn't know any gay people. She doesn't even really know that there's a word for it. So that was the challenge of depicting Lily's coming out to herself process. Like I couldn't reuse, I couldn't use any of the words that we use today uh, because she would not know them. So I um, honestly, I drew on my own experience because I grew up in the 80s. I came out in the 90s. There was no internet then. I didn't, there were no, the first famous queer person I heard of was Katie Lang in the 90s. And that was like after I was already trying to figure out what was going on with myself. So I was personally familiar with the concept of struggling with understanding what the hell is happening, <laughs> okay? So I think that probably any queer person, even those who are coming out today, understands this very um, gray, messy feeling inside, or they've had some kind of this kind of feeling where they know they are not the same as everyone you see on TV. What is that? This is a very difficult and transformative experience that every single LGBTQ person has had. So that has not changed, even though they may come to their realization today more quickly or through um, seeing a famous queer person on TikTok, they still have to come to that internally, you know? And that is something I think that we all share as queer people. Um, obviously it's much more acceptable to be queer today in many communities, but obviously not every community. So, you know, I hear from readers who come to this book from communities where it is not okay to be out. And um, there are readers who read this book and where it, in places where it is okay. So the, the experience varies widely to, based on where the person is. Um, so I don't think there's a hard and fast difference in that right in that area and the book has been uh banned quite a bit right yes yes the book has been banned quite a bit uh i haven't been keeping track in the last month <laughs> but um a, a, a couple months ago i i I've, I've been counting my the book bans because um I'm curious to see where it's banned. And so I think this book has been now banned or challenged in at least 40 communities um, since, since it came out. Most of it has been in the last year or two, right? So, but I'm not even, I, I, this book gets banned a lot, but it's not the most banned. And there are many, many books that are banned fewer times and they're still banned. So I just, I think a lot of the media about book banning focuses like recently on the, the most banned books. And um, those books are certainly banned, but there are many, many more books that are banned that do not get that kind of media attention. 
And those books are just, they're not in schools. They're removed from schools. You know, they don't get sales bumps. They don't get attention. They're just gone from those communities. And those voices disappear then. Yeah. 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 I think I, um, this, I think, Last Night at the Telegraph Club is one of the only, if not the only, young adult historical novel about queer Chinese Americans. So this is a this is a slim category, but once this book is removed from a community, that's it. I mean, there's no other book with this experience. So um, yeah, having your book banned is 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 not great. And it's also, you know, I. I feel like a lot of the attention on it is about uh, a, a lot of the attention on book banning is about um, the freedom to read and the freedom to access information. And that is absolutely an important part of it. But I, I find it, um, I think it's important to also note that having a book banned is um, a direct attack on the writer and their experiences and their voice. So it's my voice that is being banned <laughs> in these communities. And for, and all of the authors who are having their books banned, their voices are being silenced in those communities. And sure, we want to support the right to read, but no one's gonna read them if we can't write them. You know, so I, I just, I, I really feel for my fellow writers. I think it's, I, I don't know why it's the, the argument in this, the, the media coverage in this country is so much focused on the right to read because there's not gonna be anything to read if we don't write the books. And I think I come from that perspective because um, I am a Chinese immigrant. I came here from China. I knew as a child, we came here to escape that country where you do not have the freedom to write. There is no freedom of speech there. This book is not gonna be published in China. <laughs> I'm not gonna sell any Chinese rights, okay? So it's, and, and when you think about China and state suppression, you're talking about censorship of creative voices. And that's what's happening here. I mean, authors of color, queer authors, their voices are being silenced by these book bans. So it's not great. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And now, um... You mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago the ways that Lily does actually start to recognize her own sexuality. And one of the big parts of that is actually just the image of Tommy, you know, in right. in this uh, newspaper ad, right? Yeah. And um, so I was thinking, um, you know, she sort of, she worships Tommy when she sees him or her the first night. <laughs> there's the, uh, yeah. there's that sense of kind of like the frisson and everything. Um, and just, Tommy in that first appearance seems almost more like a supernatural force <laughs> than a human. She's just dancing around and everyone is. So um, uh, and now we all have had the experience as teens of seeing performers who really change the way we think. So who were the performers? And it can be just not, not just musicians, but also writers, actors, whatever, who made an impact on you, but at that age. I mean, you mentioned Katie Lang. Are there, are, are there others, like when you were a teen, who just struck you and, and whether about like, uh, you know, sexuality or anything else, like just that sort of thing where suddenly you realize there's an amplitude there. I, I need to move somehow in that direction. Well, I had no idea that gay people existed when I was a teen. So no gay people. Uh, my, and I, you know, one other thing is when I was a teen, I didn't have any books with queer characters and I, I had no, I didn't have any books with Asian American characters either. So my favorite writers who I really looked up to when I was a young person, Lily's age, were uh, Madeline Langle and Robin McKinley. And um, I loved Anne of Green Gables. Mm -hmm. I loved Little Women. Um, I loved all of these writers. And, you know, they they wrote wonderful bookish girls who were who were like me. And I, I absolutely adored them. It wasn't until I was an adult, um, well into my 20s, that I read my first novel about lesbians. And I read this book and I was like, I cannot believe this book got published. It is incredible. 
and it was Tipping the Velvet by Sarah Waters, mm -hmm. which really um, broke open my world. And I realized you can do that. I, if any of you have not read that book, you should read it. It's amazing. It's, um, it's amazing. And one of the proudest moments of my life um, was when um, she blurbed this book. <laughs> yes. I, I literally, it is still like the most spine tingling memory. I, oh my God, it was amazing because she is absolutely a literary hero of mine. That's amazing. That's great. And yeah. um, so uh, we're going to switch over to audience questions in just a minute. But, um, you know, following on from that, um, over the course of your career, the discussion about race and publishing has really changed. Mm -hmm. um, and you've played an, a, a, an important role in that in some cases. So do you want to talk about that history a little before we go to audience questions? Well, you're just a little question. <laughs> a little tiny topic. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Just um, what should I say about this? Um, things are a lot better now than when I like my first book came out in 2009. Um, when was your first book out? Uh, 1996. Okay, so you got a few years on me. So things have improved a lot since 1996, yeah. and since 2009, even incredibly. Uh, my my first novel, Ash, was. Um, a, a lesbian Cinderella. There had not really been any fantasy with queer characters published before my, before Ash came out. And in my head, this is this is a in my head, Ash, the main character. I imagined her as looking Asian. Okay, but I did not put that in the book because I thought she's already gay. I can't like add this. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be too much. No, they're not, no one's gonna buy it. I mean, they're barely gonna buy it if she's gay. If she's a gay Asian, that's never gonna happen. So I did not make that uh, explicit in the book. Mm -hmm. And that I think is the biggest marker of difference between now and then. You know, like now that would be welcomed. That would be welcomed. I, I don't know whether it would um, necessarily get a huge marketing push, who knows, but it would be welcomed by readers and librarians and, and by everyone who knows that today's young people are diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, Gen Z is very diverse. So that has changed. That is a huge change. Yeah. And I think it's really important for the younger people in the audience just to notice like the kind of shifts that you're talking about, like the fact that for, you know, now, um, uh, fantasy romance, including like gay fantasy romance, is you know really kind of in the center of a spotlight. It's really kind of welcomed in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just it's it's sort of amazing and wonderful, but also a little bit bizarre that things can shift so much in in a short space of time. Yeah, and you know? and that's why there's this book banning backlash. Right, exactly. That's one right, reason. they're connected. Right. So yeah. there's a lot more now for them to ban. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So let's, why don't we go to audience questions? Uh, come on up. There are, it looks like there are uh, uh, microphones on either side of the uh, room and um, come on up and, and ask Melinda some questions. You know, you have them. And I, I can begin okay. with one from, from Zoom. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. And so a question from Janice, if your book is banned in a school, yeah. is it also banned at the bookstores in these communities? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know what is happening in these local communities unless people tell me. So I have I have no idea. But there have been attempts to prevent booksellers from even stocking LGBT books. So a lot of times people are like, it's not really banned. You can buy it at the bookstore. But the um, conservative movement to ban books has not left bookstores untouched. I mean, that the law in the law in Texas that is currently being um, contested in involves bookstores, and it, so, and also teens don't always you know have credit cards and money, so they can't necessarily just go to the Barnes and Noble and get it. And I can say that I know that for example, um, I think it was um, uh, I think it was Scientani Dasgupta was just telling me about having a uh, a bookstore event canceled. Um, because there was pressure from the school. Uh, no, well, from a, one of the moms groups, oh, like moms, okay. is it moms for liberty? Moms for liberty. Moms for, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so the bookstore had, had was almost 
uh, pre-assessing that threat and decided to cancel her uh, book event, which which is not, in fact, even a uh, a book that involves anything um, romantic, erotic, or whatever. It just ha so happens that the characters are of Indian descent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so weirdly enough, that was actually enough to cause the bookstore to kind of say, oh, we don't want to have a you know, so it's a self banning that can happen too. Yeah, that could, that happens. I think well, we don't know how often it happens, but we do know that it does happen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh gosh, very racking. <laughs> so I was so, you know, as a young queer person from an Asian American family who immigrated to America, like I was so excited to first read this book and and have representation in that way and to like give voice in that way. It was very unique and and I didn't find it until I was like graduated from college in my 20s. So I can't imagine being Lily's age and reading this. Um, so it feels like a love letter to what intersectional, like multitudes of identities feel like. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you put into the book, whether it be a conversation or a reference or a place that you put in there just for you? Just for me. Well, honestly, as I said earlier, I went to a lot of lesbian bars. <laughs> so I think a lot, some of what Lily's experiences at the Telegraph Club really do reflect some of my own experiences of going out into the queer community in San Francisco, connecting with uh, my friends there. And it is a love letter to that. I felt so much at home there. And um, yeah, I loved I loved writing those scenes, especially. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question from Zoom. This is from Jacob. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of research that went into this book. What was one of the favorite stories that you uncovered during this time? One of my one of my favorite stories. Um, let me think. Well, I don't know if this is the right audience for this story, but um <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well, okay, so in the book, you know, Lil, I don't know if you've all read the book, but Lily goes to, she goes shopping at Macy's, and um, this, the, the, at one point, she recognizes someone who works there as a patron of the Telegraph Club, and um, during my research, I, uh, when I went to listen to that cassette tape of that interview, the person in that interview had worked at a department store in San Francisco. And she said that when she worked there, all of the managers on the second floor were lesbians who went to Wellesley, which <laughs> I thought was great because I went to Wellesley. So I felt very proud of my alma mater at that point. Wait a second, I think you need to show people actually the shirt you're wearing with all of your, yeah. Shirt that is from, Mo it's a picture from Mona's 440 which is a real, this was a real club in San Francisco. I don't get to wear this often, so I I, I got to bring it out when I can. <laughs> and it plus the dinner jacket, it's very, you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah I, very I stylish. try to be on theme. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks for being here. Really excited. Um, I was really struck by what you said about having to find yourself in the footnotes of the research. Um, and as someone, I work with future secondary teachers. So I was just wondering, is there anything you would like future teachers to know about how to encourage their students so that, you know, future readers and writers don't have to only find themselves in the footnotes? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I hope that teachers will give their students a variety of books to read with, you know, stories about every kind of, everyone, stories about everyone to show them that they they exist, you know, because it is really alienating to grow up and go to school and see nothing about anyone who looks like you in the in the curriculum. It's it's very, very alienating. So I, I the world is very different now. And there's so many more books out there. And I just hope that teachers take advantage of all these new materials and include a diversity of representation in the stuff that they're teaching. Because I think that's what that's what students need to see that they, they exist in history and they exist in print. And um, it's very empowering to see that. And I think that the point should be made also that the book bannings we've been talking about are not simply about like 
gay and lesbian issues or like uh, issues connected to sexuality or whatever else. It's also just kind of like American history, the reality of American history, especially connected with anything having to do with racial relations, that's also disappearing. Mm -hmm. So it's really this sort of the fabric of reality that's being yes. eaten away at, yes. you know, I think it's really important to establish that that is also something and that, yeah. I, I have a question about the what I remember is the opening scene in the book, which, which is the Miss Chinatown mm -hmm. pageant. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the, the choice to open with that, um, whether you remember your intentions with that and whether it was like kind of a multiple intentions and perhaps it's is it to ground it in Chinatown? Is it to ground it in the 1950s? Is it to say something about the expectation for uh, women in in that time, in that place, in that community? Well, so the the first chapter where they go to the Miss Chinatown um, contest in 1950, it was a picnic at the 4th of July. That was the, the like one of the earlier Miss Chinatowns. That, that was, I wrote that, I think, before the second draft. So the first draft didn't have it. And um, earlier when I was imagining the book, I thought that Lily was going to enter the Miss Chinatown contest and as I wrote the book, I realized Lily in no way was going to do that. <laughs> she had no interest in entering the Miss Chinatown contest. And she was like, no, I'm not. I'm never doing that. Don't you write that scene. Um, I couldn't write it because she wouldn't do it. So I felt like I still had to have something like that in there to explain why, why it was so important. And so I wrote this, this prologue um, and... It does go into it. It really kind of sets up the the idea of expectations. You know, like the expectations that Lily's parents have for her, that the the Chinese community has for girls in that community, the expectations that her best friend Shirley has, and um, the the issues that Lily has with all those expectations. Like that that all comes up in the in the prologue through the vehicle of this Miss Chinatown contest. I mean, beauty pageants are so fascinating mm -hmm. and they have so many layers of expectations. It was really a perfect cultural anthropological moment for me to exploit <laughs> um, in telling the story. Um, I just want to thank you for the book. I'm, I'm from San Francisco. I yeah. grew up there. Mm -hmm live most of my life there. Um, and I just want to ask um, what what the, your research that you did and going to the, spending a lot of time in the bars, what was your favorite bar? My favorite bar. <laughs> my, my favorites were uh, The Hole in the Wall, uh, The Eagle. I've uh, been to The Eagle. I used to <laughs> love The Eagle. Yeah. Were there any other bars? That... Well, when I was in San Francisco, I used to go to this burlesque show called In Bed with Fairy Butch. Yeah. And I actually worked there. I was not a dancer. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I did the, I worked at the Tingle and Mingle table. This is like. Remember, um, this is being transcribed. Yeah, that's fine. I, I, uh... People know this. It, it's like, um, it was a dating thing. So if you had a, a crush on someone, you would come to the tingle and mingle table and I would give you a number and you would you would write your number, you would pin a number on you and you would leave them a note and we would like hang it up on a clothesline. It was pre-internet, okay? <laughs> so I I used to work at this this club with um a bunch of friends of mine, and that was really it was fun. I mean, it was like a very grungy type of bar. <laughs> But we had a really good time. Was Tranny Shot gone when you were there? Yes, I think so. Yeah. So this one was in the mission at some place that it was it moved around. So yeah. And for for um we can talk more later. <laughs> for Vermonters, uh, if you're interested, there really has only been one uh true gay bar in the history of Vermont. Um, which is it was in Bellows Falls, in fact, and has a really super interesting history from the 70s to the early 80s. And I recommend if you're interested uh, that you you look into that. It just has an interesting little anthropologically. It's interesting how it fits into Vermont culture as a whole. 
Um, and I recommend that you go check it out. Yeah. We have time for just a couple more questions. I know there's a couple questions on Zoom, but I want to make sure that we get any questions in the audience. Um, <laughs> you almost smacked one in the forehead. Here you go. <laughs> um, so I am a writer and I have a lot of ideas and I'm just always bouncing around from one to the next. Do you ever start writing an idea and then like go, I have another idea, I'm gonna throw this out. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, that's <laughs> typical. I mean, I, especially when I was your age, I did that all the time. This is this is the way you learn how to figure out what's a good idea and what's a bad idea. Because everything looks really good at first, right? So by doing this, you start to realize what's what's actually a good story idea and what's just very shiny, <laughs> you know? So um, that's totally normal. You should you should do it. You should do it. And if you come up with an idea that kind of sticks with you more, you think if you if you find yourself thinking about it a lot, you know, um, keep at it and try to finish one story. You know, it's very important. Have you finished a story? Yes. So you've already done that. So you you know what it's like to finish a story. So just keep a lookout for those ideas. Like, think about why you finished that story. Why was that idea so exciting to you that you worked it all the way to the end? Keep an eye out for why, for stories that feel like that one to you, for ideas that feel like that one. Yeah, so um, the book is obviously in the YA category, and it's great <laughs> to see some young people here today, but there's a lot of older people here, right? <laughs> Reading this book and connecting to this book and how do you view it through that lens as opposed to saying, giving young people today something to look at as an example, but then there's older people that might have gone through an experience like yours that you're giving them access to a, to a youth they might not have had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I actually don't really think about the age category when I'm writing a book. Um, so this book, this book was, is unique in that it was, well, it's not unique, but it was it, it was published in the UK for as an adult novel, and in the in the US as YA. So YA versus adult are marketing categories, <laughs> you know. As an author, I really follow the story that I'm trying to tell. I follow the story, whether it is because I have a history in YA. My books have been published in YA. Some of them are more YA than others. I think this one is more adult than some YA, um, but I really don't think about the age category. But even if, with my books that are more YA, I always have had adult readers, especially queer adult readers, read my books. Because for many of us who are adults and are queer, when we were teenagers, we didn't have books about coming out. We didn't have books about discovering your first love when you're actually a teenager. <laughs> so, I think it can be very um, satisfying and cathartic for adult queer readers to read YA about queer characters because we didn't have those experiences, you know. And I, so I, it, I, it's totally normal for me to have an audience that's mixed with plenty of adults in there, especially those who are coming to this from a queer perspective. Can I follow up on that one with a, a second marketing question? Uh, I want to shout out to the masculine identified people in the room. There's about five of us <laughs> in a room of a hundred people. Um, how do you think about trying to get diverse audiences? Do you mean like your... men? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think about that. <laughs> I, I welcome. I welcome men to read my books. <laughs> Shout out to the men. <laughs> I think may maybe we could finish with one question from Zoom, if that's all right. Um, talks about process, but also about maybe it's apt, uh, how the book ended. Um, Susan says, thank you for this wonderful talk and this wonderful book. I especially appreciated how you ended the book. Can you tell us how you got to the ending? Were there multiple drafts? I think maybe you did mention that there are multiple drafts. Um, or was it clear early on? And kind of a similar question from Dana, you know, how similar is the published book to the first draft of the book? Oh, the first draft is terrible. It was absolutely terrible. 
There was no romance in it. Hmm. I know. <laughs> I know. I wrote the whole first draft and I was like, this is not working because they, those two clearly want to get together. And I did not let them do that in the first draft. And so I, this is, writing is very, a lot of my writing is very subconscious. I, I have to write it and then I read it and I see, or my editor will see, this is what needs to happen. <laughs> And then I have to go back and change it. <laughs> so the first draft was nothing like the end. And uh, the ending changed several times. Um, and I don't know, what, what can I say about the ending? I don't want to like spoil it too much. Um, it's a happy ending, can we say? Well, I just did. People just... argue over whether it's a happy ending, OK? Like, I, I think it's um, a realistic ending. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I'm not someone who needs a happily ever after ending. So some for people who want one, you can interpret it that way. And for people who who don't want one, you can interpret it that way. <laughs> so I hope I have um, served all re readerships with the ending <laughs> of this book. <laughs> it's like choose your own interpretation of what happened. <laughs> Seems like a good place to close it out. Uh, I want to say thank you, of course, to MT and to Melinda, to the National uh, Book Foundation, to Phoenix Books uh, for selling books in the lobby. Please do uh, buy some books. Uh, MT and Melinda will be signing them for you. Uh, before we um, close out, though, I also want to note that there is currently a bill in the Vermont legislature, S-220, um, that would require all uh, libraries, both school and public libraries in the state of Vermont, to have robust book challenge policies that protect the freedom to read, um, as well as the right of uh, community members to find voices that are like theirs um, in their school and public library. If you feel so moved, you can call your local legislator and ask them to try and make sure that S-220 makes it through the process and becomes law um, this session. I will also add that a very important thing that the bill will do um, is lower the age of confidentiality of library records from its current age of 16 to 12, ensuring that young people's library records are confidential and that they can read what they want um, without fear. Thank you very much for coming. Please um, bring your books out to the front or buy some books. and. Um, and you can have a couple of minutes to chat with MT and Melinda out front. Thanks. And thanks to Melinda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming up here. Thank you for, for the questions. Thank you.